The test is divided into four sections. All the recordings are played once only. Now, turn to section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full-time or part-time? Oh, I couldn't manage full-time as I work every day, but evenings would be fine and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway, but let me run through your options. We have a 12-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course, or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels. Beginners, lower intermediate and upper intermediate, though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next Level 2 course begins on Monday the 12th of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I'd prefer the next course. Now you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H-A-G-A-R-T-Y? Uh, no. H-A-G-E-R-T-Y. Oh, OK. And your address, Richard? Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's Ricky45, uh, that's one word, R-I-C-K-Y-4-5, at hotmail.com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? I was born on the 29th of February, 1980. 1980? So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, so I'll put down conversation. Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level, and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school, uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes.
but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrollment form, we'll contact you. You have some time to check your answers from 1 to 10 of Section 1. Now, turn to Section 2. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Thank you for calling ATS Advanced Ticketing System, the call system for all your entertainment needs. Our automated telephone service is designed to answer your questions quickly and easily. The ATS office in the Regency Theatre is open Monday to Thursdays from 10am to 5pm and on Friday and Saturday till 8pm. For online bookings and detailed program listings, check our website at www.atsticks.com. That's spelled A T S T I X. Please listen to the choices available. You may press your choice as soon as you hear it to get more information. For sporting events, including the Western International Tennis Classic, press 1. For the Formula One Grand Prix, press 2. For classical music, including the upcoming Philharmonic Orchestra Series, press 3. For theatre and dance, press 4. For other inquiries, please hold the line. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Ticket prices for the Formula One Grand Prix on the 10th until the 14th of March are as follows. General admission, Thursday, $27. Concession, $10. Friday, $37. Concession, $15. Saturday, $55. Concession, $35. Sunday, $70. Concession, $65. Concession rates apply to children under 14 and to students, seniors and pensioners on presentation of a valid card. Grandstand seating. Four-day tickets covering the six main grandstands cost $299. However, pit straight tickets are $350 and seats at the chicane cost $450 each. Children under three are admitted free to the general admissions area and children under 14 are eligible for concession prices. Gates open at 8am Thursday and Friday and 7.30 Saturday and Sunday. Events begin at nine o'clock. Alcohol, ice boxes, Cans, bottles and animals are not allowed on site. 
there are no refunds or exchanges. On each ticket, a $2.50 booking fee applies. To make a booking, you must have a valid credit card. To listen again, press 1. To make a booking or to talk to a ticket agent, press 2. Your call is in our queue. You can expect to wait about three minutes. You have some time to check your answers from 11 to 20 of section 2. Now, turn to section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic, and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked, and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. 
The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. You have some time to check your answers from 21 to 30 of Section 3. Now, turn to section 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have with us Mr. Kevin Ackroyd, a representative from the Department of Environment, to outline the results of last year's inquiry into environmental problems along the coastline. Mr. Ackroyd, please. Thank you, Ms. Cranston. Good afternoon, everyone. Perhaps it would be best if I first outline for you what I plan to talk about. I'll begin with some background to the inquiry looking at the new demands we are making on our old resources, so to speak, and go on to give some idea of the conclusions we came to in our inquiry. Okay, first the background. The inquiry was sparked off because various concerned residents in the coastal region realized that the recent population shift, which really got going in the 1970s, was putting extreme pressure on our coastal environment. Over the past two decades, half of the country's population growth has been in the non-metropolitan areas. Today, 9 out of 10 people live in the coastal zone. The reasons for this shift are not yet fully understood, but there is a range of factors which probably contribute, including economic development, an aging population, and a growth in industry, particularly tourism and its associated industries. We would have to admit that government policies have also contributed to this trend, a trend which is likely to continue so that it's estimated by the year 2005 there will be millions of additional people living in the non-metropolitan coastal zone. This population expansion puts considerable pressure on the natural resources of the zone 
and there are two factors likely to impose particular strains. These are, firstly, that those areas of greatest growth in the past are likely to continue to grow as strongly as before. In other words, urban sprawl or expansion will continue for at least another decade. The second factor contributing to the pressure is industry, particularly the newer industries like tourism. These newer industries will compete for resources with other users, such as the intensive fish and shellfish farming industry. All of this will take place in an environment that is already under severe stress. And in particular, the water resources will be degraded. It is the view of the inquiry that water degradation, whether of seas, rivers, or lakes, is the greatest resource problem in the coastal zone as a whole. Now, the conclusion of the inquiry can be stated quite plainly and simply. First, we must raise the profile of the coastal zone in our thinking, especially in our approach to conservation and economic development. Second, we must exercise much greater vision. We must be prepared to think in the long term rather than the short term and to pay attention to details. So better management and better planning. And thirdly, we must adopt a national approach. We can no longer afford to leave the decision-making to individual departments, to local government bodies, or even to the central government. We are looking here at the need for coordination on a nationwide level. To achieve workable, effective results involving all levels of government, as well as the various non-government organizations in this country, will be no easy task. But it is imperative we try. Well, I see time is running out, so perhaps if I just summarize the recommendations made by the inquiry for you. The long view prevails over the short. Broad considerations predominate over narrow. The techniques of modern management and the tools of modern economic are brought into operation. People being affected by decisions, including indigenous people, are adequately consulted before decisions are made. With that, I'll stop and give the opportunity to, to ask questions, but perhaps first I should tell you that the full report of the inquiry... You have some time to check your answers from 31 to 40 of Section 4. In the IELTS exam, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.